This is Ray Moss Holder, and I'm excited again about a book. This is a book, do you hear about, by the way, did you hear about the murder in the library? Somebody's nose was found buried in a book. Anyway, this is one of those books you're going to bury your nose in because it's such a great book. And is written by Craig Parshall. And I am partial to Craig Parshall. And uh, this is just one of the books in the Chambers of Justice book. It is book one. And we will continue with more books. Because <laughs> you just can't miss Craig Parshall's writing. But let's get into it. Chapter 13. The Red Rooster was quickly filling up. There was a bizarre excitement in the air. Pitchers of beer were already circulating. There were the usual after-work frequenters, mostly office staff, some younger professional types, secretaries, teachers, and salesmen. But tonight the crowd was bigger and louder than usual. Friendly arguments and lively speculations were already breaking out, the kind that you would normally see only before the start of an important ball game. But tonight, there was no ball game scheduled, or at least no game that this crowd had come to see. The overhead television sets were normally set to sports channels, and tonight, they were all tuned in to the World Cable Network. On the television screen, there were some newsmen talking, and the word live appeared in the corner of the screen. Four blocks away from the Red Rooster, Will Chambers looked out his window and noticed the sun going down. He set the McCameron file aside, along with the Bible that he had in front of him, and decided to stroll down to the Red Rooster for a meal. It was still warm outside, early evening, as Will left the building. He walked down the cobblestone sidewalks that had grown uneven with age, and along the narrow tree-lined streets, he kept thinking back to something he had been reading back at the office. He had read the article that McCameron had written in Digging for Truth magazine as a rebuttal to Reichstadt's claims about the 7QA fragment. McCameron's article kept referring to passages in the New Testament. So Will had sent Betty scurrying down to the bookstore to get a Bible. When Betty returned, she knocked on the door of his office. He called her in, and she handed him the plastic bag from the bookstore without saying a word. But she gave Will a quizzical look, like she had wanted to make a sarcastic remark, but had then thought better of it. The McCameron article made a reference to the Gospel of John, chapter 11. So Will fumbled unsuccessfully through the Bible to look it up. He finally checked the table of contents and located it. It was a story of Jesus going to the funeral of a guy named Lazarus, who had already been dead and buried for several days. Jesus told the people to remove this stone. They were all concerned because the body was already beginning to rot and stink. But they removed the stone, and then Lazarus walked out of the tomb with his grave wrappings still wound around his entire body. Lazarus, so dead that a corpse had already begun to decay, had been brought back to life 
in front of a number of witnesses. We'll read about the conversation Jesus had had just before the resurrection of Lazarus with one of the sisters of the dead man. In verse 25, we'll read this. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live even if he dies. And everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? When Will read this, it was as if he had been hit full in the face, like a swimmer in the ocean slammed by a huge unexpected wave. For just an instant, Will felt as if that question, do you believe this, had been directed to him, as if there were someone in the room sitting across from him who had just asked him, Will Chambers, do you believe what you're reading? And for some reason, that question in the silence of his office had taken on the roaring power of a tidal wave. Will rarely trusted his emotions. So he chalked up his strange reaction to either stress or fatigue or both. As he neared the red rooster, Will realized he hadn't had a drink for a while. Maybe it was time to start catching up. When Will walked in, he couldn't see a spare table available. So he grabbed the last open stool at the bar. It's crowded, Will noted the bartender. Then he ordered his usual steak sandwich and onion rings. What are you drinking tonight? For a split second, Will struggled with his decision on how he was going to respond. So he ignored the bartender and glanced over at the television set. On the screen, two news anchors were talking at a desk. Behind them, there was a country outlined on a map with the words Saudi Arabia in large letters. What do you have, Will? The bartender asked again. Just then, a foreign reporter came on the screen. The crowd in the Red Rooster suddenly quieted down. Hey, What's the deal here? The bartender looked at him a little incredulously. Are you kidding? Where you been lately on the space shuttle? No, seriously, what is this? Will questioned, nodding his head toward the television. The Wall Street bombers, or at least some of the guys who planned it, they're going to be executed today. It's been all over the news the last 24 hours. They finally caught them. Was there a trial I missed? The bartender laughed. Oh, this is Saudi Arabia, Will. I don't think it works the same over there. They probably beat a confession out of these guys. Hey, who cares? The point is they're getting what they deserve, the death penalty. No appeals, no drawn out legal case. Just quick justice. And that's fine by me. Somebody yelled out to turn up the television. The bartender bent over to a knob and turned the volume up. The reporter was warning the audience that what they were about to see would be both shocking and graphic. He calmly explained how, after the New York trucking incident, the U.S. State Department had put additional pressure on the Saudis for cooperation. And as a result, new information had come to light about last year's Wall Street bombing, and the Saudis, based on that information, had immediately arrested two 
suspected terrorists. They obtained quick confessions, conducted a cursory magistrate inquiry, and imposed a sentence of death on both of them. The method of execution would be public beheading. Then two men with black hoods over their heads were led by armed guards onto a platform. Their arms were tied behind them. Their legs were shackled, so they had to make little shuffling steps forward until they were in front of two large wooden blocks that came up to their waists. They were pushed down to a kneeling position. Each guard held a long pole with a wire neck loop at the end. With the poles, the heads of the two men were forced and held face down onto the wooden blocks from behind. Two executioners in long robes and with huge silver-bladed axes appeared beside the prisoners. And before Will could process what he was seeing, the two executioners swung their axes over their heads with blinding speed and brought them down under the necks of the criminals. Two kneeling bodies fell over to the side, blood flowing, flowing from the headless necks. The crowd and the red rooster jumped to their feet, cheering and yelling. The noise continued as people raised their fists and continued to cheer at the television set, giving each other high fives. One couple left immediately, the woman shaking her head. The man with her was grimacing slightly. Will stared at the television set but didn't speak. After a while, the bartender came back and asked him again what he was going to drink. You know, I just remembered that I've got to be somewhere, Will said, and threw some money on the bar. Well, aren't you going to stick around for your steak? I lost my appetite, Will replied. Oh, I forgot, Will. You're one of those bleeding heart liberals. The bartender shot back with a little laugh. Exactly when did the world start getting so strange, Will adds. But he directed his question to no one in particular and didn't wait for an answer. He was quickly out on the street walking back toward his office. Now all he wanted to do was to get to his car and go home. Suddenly, the company of his loyal golden retriever seemed preferable to that of the human race. Chapter 14 In Washington the next day, news reporters were crowding into the room at the press club. In the front of the room, the moderator of the press conference glanced at his watch and then looked out over the room filled with television cameras and reporters. Behind the moderator, there was a row of six men and three women, standing and smiling stiffly. One of the women had a clerical collar, as did three of the men. Another was arrayed in bishop's robes. Then the moderator stepped up to the tangle of microphones at the podium. He smiled and thanked everyone for coming. Let me say first, the moderator explained, that we are not going to be commenting today about the fact that two men were executed on live international television last night. There were a few snickers from the reporters. That is the subject 
for another press conference, perhaps at another time. We're here today to comment on the 7QA fragment and its implications for 21st century Christianity. Then the moderator looked down at his prepared notes and began. This coalition represents a broad cross-section of the Christian denominations in America. As such, we have representatives from the National Council of Churches, from the American Conference of Bishops, and from most major segments of the mainland Christian community. Now, each of our representatives will be giving a short statement. But by way of introduction, I want you to know that a joint statement has been prepared by our coalition. And there should be enough copies of this statement for all of you on the table in the back of the room so you can pick one up as you leave. The moderator introduced the representatives who each in turn made three minute statements. Then the floor was open for questions. The first question came from a newswoman in the front. Well, doesn't this 7QA fragment mean that Christians everywhere will have to start questioning everything they used to believe in the gospel stories? Questioning who Jesus really was? In response, several speakers from the panel emphasized that faith and science were partners in truth and not combatants. Yes, there would perhaps be a new understanding of Jesus, but that is the essence of faith, that it is a living and evolving concept, not a static, rigid, absolutist experience. What if this archaeological discovery disproves the resurrection? One reporter asked. Wouldn't that be the end of Christianity? Not all the panelists replied. One speaker emphasized that the jury was still out on 7QA. Well, on the other hand, the verdict on the traditional idea of Christ had been settled for 2,000 years. Another panelist pointed out that the resurrection was a spiritual idea with spiritual aspects to it. If Jesus wasn't physically resurrected, that didn't mean there was not, in some sense, a spiritual resurrection in order to successfully survive in the 21st century, the panelists pointed out, Christianity needed to, in effect, reinvent itself. That included being willing to rediscover who Jesus really was. Then a question came from a reporter in the back of the room, Jack Hornby, a veteran from the Washington Herald, stood up and said he was addressing his question to anyone on the panel who would like to respond. Now, this spiritual resurrection that you're talking about sounds pretty safe, pretty bland, and if you'll pardon my observation, pretty meaningless. In light of the 7QA fragment discovery, why not fight for the idea that either Jesus really walked out of the grave or else he didn't. If he didn't, then maybe it's time for Christianity to take him down from a throne, in a manner of speaking. After a few of the panelists tried somewhat unsuccessfully to respond, the moderator stepped up to the microphone. This was a difficult and complicated issue and couldn't be answered. He said in a simple way, 
Indeed, it could not be answered in the kind of abbreviated and simplified format that many reporters would prefer. Then why did you bother to call a press conference and invite the press? Hornby shot back. But before he irritated, before the irritated moderator could close, Hornby launched a final question. I would be interested in your reaction to the lawsuit that was recently filed by Dr. Reichstad, the scientist who discovered this fragment. He has sued a Reverend Angus McCameron who criticized his interpretations of the fragment. Are you aware of that lawsuit? And if so, what is your response? The moderator responded firmly, we are aware of that lawsuit as we understand it. This lawsuit is some kind of blood feud, if I can call it that, between Dr. Reichstead and this fundamentalist preacher, McCameron. Now further, we don't believe that a right-wing religious extremist like McCameron has anything intelligence, intelligent to add to the debate over the 7QA Jesus fragment. Well, as the reporters quickly pushed their way out of the room, one of them came over to Hornby. Did you make it over to the press conference of the Union of Conservative Baptists and the American Evangelical Alliance this morning? Yep, I caught most of it. I missed it, the other reporter noted. I didn't think I could make that one and still get here for the one and for this one and then make my deadline by noon. So anything interesting? Hornby smiled. He knew he was being pumped for news by a competitor. Some reporters really took a hard line on that sort of thing, and many of them would ignore that kind of ploy and walk away. Others, even more direct, would tell another reporter to buzz off. But Jack Hornby had worked out his own approach over the years. Being a veteran reporter and having won a Pulitzer Prize had given him a certain leeway that others didn't have. He didn't mind tossing a few bones to the competition. He believed in freedom of the press. And maybe that meant letting the other guys know what was going on. In the end, though, Hornby had his own line in the sand where his cooperation with other reporters ended, and his own personal drive for the story took over. Well, those guys are the right-wing conservatives. These guys at the press club, on the other hand, are the moderate to liberal mainliners. Some line up as usual this morning. Same, same line up indeed. The conservatives were suggesting a couple of possible explanations for the 7QA fragment, how it really doesn't conflict with a bodily resurrection of Christ. Some of them still had doubts about its validity. I also heard that a couple of TV preachers are planning a big rally down in Atlanta over this. Then the other reporter opened the door for Hornby, as, and as he stepped out on the sidewalk, he followed up this thought, squinting a little in the noonday sun. Jack, I think a lot more people are going to end up trusting this 7QA thing than the Bible. I think as time goes on, even a lot of church-going people are going to start thinking that, hey, you don't bow down and worship Jesus if you know that he's really still dead and in his body and out there in the grave somewhere. The more I'm thinking about this, the more I believe we may have a religious revolution in the making. 
Hornby was silent, but he was eyeing the other reporter intently. Right? The reporter asked. But Hornby just kept looking at him tight-lipped. The other reporter smiled. He knew it was getting close to Hornby's line in the sand. Maybe, Hornby finally replied. Maybe not. One thing I've learned in this business, things are not always as they seem. So, what's your take on this lawsuit by Reichstadt? The reporter asked as he flagged down a cab. Well, you take this cab, I'll take the next one. Hornby shouted out as he walked in the opposite direction. The other reporter had just crossed the line. As Hornby walked away, he paged through his small notebook, looking for the telephone number of attorney Will Chambers. Earlier that day, he had checked the court file in Reichstead versus McCameron and Digging for Truth magazine. Chambers' notice of retainer had just been filed. The reporter hadn't talked to Will Chambers for a couple of years. The last contact was over a story that Hornby had written about one of Will's cases. Will had sued a federal agency for retaliating against his client, a low-level federal employee who had become a whistleblower over some illegal practices in the agency. And since that story had broken, the attorney had fallen off the reporter's radar screen. Hornby pulled his cell phone out of his pocket and started dialing Will's office. He was getting close to his deadline for getting the Reichstadt lawsuit story in the next morning's paper, but so far he had been running into a brick wall. J. Fox Sherman, who was usually more than happy to talk to the press, hadn't returned any of his phone calls. The veteran reporter figured he could coax some lively quotes out of Will. And with that, with his background investigation on the lawsuit, his editor would certainly run the story. It had all of the elements of a great feature, a controversial religious issue, defamation of the professional reputation of a renowned scientist, and an interesting matchup of lawyers. But earlier, when it stopped at the U.S. District Courthouse, just off Constitution Avenue, and reviewed the file in the clerk's office, he found the divining, defining reason why the lawsuit ought to make great copy. The case had been assigned to be tried before the brilliant and controversial jurist, Judge Jeremiah K. K. was the judge who had banned prayer at the meetings of the D.C. School Board. Yet he was also the judge who had ruled in favor of the right of a Christian rescue mission to violate zoning laws by running a soup kitchen and salvation chapel. Unpredictable and always interesting, Judge K never backed down from tough decisions. In one case, he'd ordered the President of the United States to obey a subpoena from Congress. In his order, Judge K had given the President 48 hours to comply and had indicated that he was prepared to send U.S. Marshals to the White House to enforce the order if necessary. Hornby walked down the sidewalk with his cell phone to his ear. As he waited for someone to pick up the phone at Chambers' office, he felt certain that this case was as newsworthy as any story he'd ever covered. 
Betty answered the phone and transferred the call to Will. In his typical blunt style, Hornby zeroed in on the issues of the case. He said he wanted to do a feature, possibly the first part, of an ongoing series on the lawsuit as it progressed. So what did Will think of the allegations against Reverend McCameron? Will gave him a few well-scripted comments. As Hornsby walked past the statue of Blackstone, the famed English jurist that stood guard over the front of the federal courthouse, he furiously scribbled down Will's comments on his notepad. Thanks, Will, Jack said at the end of the conversation. Look for it in tomorrow's Herald. Then Hornby circled the quote from Will that he planned on using at the conclusion of his piece. Our Constitution protects the right of free speech because that's how we ensure that our nation will remain free. But in this case, the stakes are even higher. If my client was correct in what he wrote, and it is our contention that he was, then truth itself is on trial. Hornby hailed the cab, started back to the paper. He decided to call his editor and told him that he would be able to put the final touches on the story within the hour. Hornby kept his word, turning the piece in with five minutes to spare. But by the late afternoon, the reporter had heard nothing. He sauntered over to the city editor's office. The door was closed, so he grabbed a cup of coffee and waited outside in the hallway. After a few minutes, the door swung open. The managing editor stepped out of the office, giving Hornby a less than polite nod as he walked past him and disappeared up the stairs. When Hornby walked into the room, the city editor didn't look surprised. Jack, sorry, we've decided not to run your piece, he said matter-of-factly. Why? the reporter asked, bewildered. Space? Several late-breaking things came in and bumped your story out. Like what? You mean like someone gets bit by the presidential poodle? I noticed that story about the White House dog is going to be on page one. Is that the kind of really important late-breaking news you're talking about? What's going on here? Settle down, Jack. You always take this stuff so personally. Look, all you've got is a lawsuit. Sure, some interesting stuff may eventually come out. But lawsuits get filed every day in this city. Let's give it time. See if it grows some legs. Lawsuits get filed. Jack Bullard did back, but not like this one. You know that. Come on. Tell me what the bottom line is here. The bottom line? Here it is. Your story got dumped by the managing editor. Go talk to him. I will, Hornby snapped as he strode out the office. And as he walked away, he shouted, I'll be back. I'm always open to a good story, the city editor yelled. Sure, Hornby muttered to himself as he charged up the stairs to the managing editor's office. As long as it's got the president's poodle in it. The city editor immediately punched the extension number for the managing editor. And in a few seconds was warning him that Jack Hornby was on his way up. He's... Coming to pressure you about that Reichstag level lawsuit story. 
And what did you tell him? Did we get crunch for space? Late breaking news. He didn't buy it, but then what else could I tell him? Keep Hornby out of this, the managing editor said. I'm getting some real clear signals from the publisher himself on this one. The story is considered not newsworthy. And since when does and since when does the publisher tell the journalist what is or is not newsworthy? The CD editor adds, slightly irritated. You sound like a rookie when you talk like that, the managing editor growled. Get with the program. There'll be no story on this lawsuit until I say so. And only if I say so. Meanwhile, if Hornby gives you any more problems, try this. Tell him this is a religion story. And we get religion reporters that will cover this story if it needs covering. His beat is not religion. Sure, the city editor sighed. I'm sure a Pulitzer winning reporter like Jack Hornby is going to swallow that. Then let me make it crystal clear, the voice on the other end of the telephone said. This story on the Reichstag lawsuit is dead and buried. Now you just make sure it doesn't miraculously rise up and walk out of the tomb on the third day, all right? Before the city editor could respond, his superior had hung up on him. The CD editor cleaned up a few things on his desk, and as he grabbed his coat to leave early for the day, he heard footsteps coming down the hallway. He knew it was Hornby. The footsteps were heavy, and they were coming fast. As he braced for Hornby to blow into his office again, he said to himself out loud, this isn't going to be pretty. Chapter 15 It had only been two weeks since Will filed his response to the Reichstag lawsuit and served it on the opposing side, the offices of J. Fox Sherman. The case was still in its infancy. So the item in Will's morning mail took him by surprise. As he sat in the lobby of his office, Will opened up the envelope from Kenilworth, Sherman, Abrams, and Cantwell. In it, Will found a notice of deposition from Sherman. Will's opponent had announced his intention to take the testimony of his client Reverend Angus McCameron, by deposition. It was scheduled to take place at Sherman's offices in D.C. the following week. Now, it wasn't the fact of a deposition that startled Will. Such procedures were the lifeblood of any lawsuit. Depositions, the giving of pretrial testimony, were usually taken in the offices of one of the attorneys and were more informal than a court proceeding, with only the opposing attorneys, a court reporter, and the witness present. With no presenting judge in attendance, they often created a freewheeling kind of psychological drama as one attorney questioned, probed, and cajoled the opposing party under oath. At the same time, the other attorney would object, obfuscate, distract, and defend, and all the while hoping that his client would not make that one thoughtless, careless, 
case-destroying admission that the court reporter would dutifully transcribe for the court for the jury to read later. The thing that intrigued Will Chambers most was the fact that it was coming so early in the lawsuit. Conventional litigation wisdom was that you go to written discovery first, questions that would have to be answered under oath, or written demands for the other side to produce notes or documents that might relate to the issues of the case. After getting the responses to written discovery, a lawyer would then have a factual roadmap and could set up a deposition of the other party in order to gain live testimony on the precise issues, aiming for the center of the target with questions like heat-seeking missiles. The lawyer could hammer at the weak points as well as to ask questions designed to fill in the blind spots of the case. So why, Will asked himself, was Sherman racing to take the testimony of McCameron so quickly out of the gate? Was it merely bravado from one of Washington's finest lawyers? Perhaps. Although Sherman was too arrogant to feel he needed to impress anyone else. He was the kind of lawyer that just assumed you were already in awe of him. Will was mulling over that question when he walked into the coffee room. Betty was pouring herself a cup. You know something, Will, she commented. I've read the Washington Herald every day since you had the telephone interview with that reporter. I don't think they ever ran this story. Will merely grunted in response, discovering a little sourly that Betty had taken the last full cup of coffee, leaving only a sinister black film at the bottom of the pot. Betty, how about making some more coffee? Well, how about you and I talking about my raise? Then we can talk about my making some more coffee. End of the day today, we'll talk. I'll be there, Betty said, half smiling and walking back to her desk. The promise to give Betty a raise had slipped his mind. He'd been preoccupied over the last two weeks. He'd received inquiries from about a half a dozen prospective clients. However, only two had panned out, and this wasn't good news. He was starting to shift into some heavy-duty anxiety about his professional career. Will had met with his mortgage lender in an effort to borrow some cash against his house but he was sold flatly that he was already mortgaged to the hilt. In fact, the state of the house with its uncompleted renovation made it bad collateral for another loan. Will had also been busy trying to, go, to negotiate a higher buyout figure from his former partners. Despite his confrontational final meeting, he somehow believed that they would cut him some slack. But now that they were no longer returning his calls, Will was feeling desperate. The only complex litigation he had was the McCameron lawsuit. And he wondered how long it would be before the money from the fundamentalist preacher's tiny magazine would start drying up. Will buzzed Betty on the intercom and asked her to get J. Fox Sherman on the line. He knew he had to buy some extra time before exposing his client 
to deposition questioning from someone as cunning as Sherman. Besides, Will was still unsure about the facts of such an unusual, complicated case. He wasn't expecting a report back from Tiny for at least another two weeks. Will had asked the big private eye to contact each of the archaeological experts who had written articles critical of Reichstad's handling of the 7QA fragment. <clears throat> in Tanya's interviews, hopefully some damaging information about Reichstad or his discovery of the fragment would surface. He was looking for any information they had in their back pockets, the kind of stuff that would be too controversial or scandalous, perhaps, to have made it into their polite scholarly writing. Betty's voice came over the intercom, telling Will that Sherman's office was on the line. Will picked up the phone. It was the receptionist from Sherman's law firm. Chambers asked for Sherman and he was transferred to the receptionist in the litigation department and after that to the personal secretary for J. Fox Sherman. Then Will was put on hold for several minutes. Finally, Will was able to explain to Sherman's secretary that he needed to speak to Sherman personally about a case they had pending together. In a few minutes, Will was transferred again. Then he heard a man's voice at the other end. Mr. Sherman, Will Chambers here, I'm calling on the Reichstag versus McCameron suit. I'm not Mr. Sherman. The voice at the other end responded. I'm Mr. Sherman's chief law clerk. Mr. Sherman can't talk to you right now. He's unavailable. Can I help you? I need to talk to Mr. Sherman personally about a deposition he just scheduled on one week's notice in a new lawsuit that isn't even out of the cradle yet. I'd like to get that deposition moved down the track a week or two. Oh, yes. Well, I'm familiar with that case. You'd like to get the deposition adjourned for a few weeks? That's what Mr. Sherman and I need to talk about. Well, just a moment, the law clerk said, and then will waited on the line for another 10 minutes. When the voice came back on the other end, it was the law clerk again. Well, I'm sorry, Mr. Sherman regrets that he'll be unable to reschedule the deposition. He looks forward to taking the testimony of your client next week at the exact time and date indicated in our notice of deposition. Mr. Sherman was capable of speaking to you. Why, yes. Then he fully is capable of speaking to me about this. No, I'm afraid Mr. Sherman is too busy to talk to you. Mr. Sherman's not attempting to intimidate me, is he? Will bulleted back. Because if he is, then Mr. Sherman's going to end up taking my self-improvement class. I call it phone etiquette for the self-impressed, self-aggrandizing DC lawyer who likes to hide behind his support staff so he can try to look lofty and powerful. After a moment of silence, the law clerk said, I will inform Mr. Sherman of your comments, Mr. And then the law clerk stifled a little laugh and said primly, I am sorry. We've never heard of you before. What is your name again? Let me make it easy for you, Will responded abruptly. Just remember me 
as the lawyer who ended up winning this case. And with that, he slapped down the phone. After spending 20 years in courtrooms around the nation, Will Chambers had learned at least this much. Every lawsuit is like a war. So he had developed the habit of naming his bigger lawsuits after famous military conflicts. Some were like the War of 1812. Others were like the Civil War. Still others, he labeled the War of the Roses or the Hundred Years War. After a short conversation with Sherman's office, Will was already visualizing the contours of this particular legal battle. D-Day, Omaha Beach, he thought to himself. The only problem was that unlike General Eisenhower, he wasn't commanding a massive invasion force. Yet the analogy still seemed to fit. After all, it seemed certain that there were going to be heavy casualties. He called for Betty to contact McCameron and tell him that he had to be in Will's office at one o'clock the next afternoon. Will would finish his initial planning and review in the morning, and then he and McCameron would immediately start planning for the deposition. For a fleeting moment, Will's concentration was interrupted with a vision of the casualties of war, of old newsreel footage of soldiers' bodies floating in the waters of Normandy. Then he realized how absurd that thought had been. No matter what the casualties of this case might be, Will mused to himself, at least no one would be trying to kill him. And right there we're going to stop. But oh boy, what's coming? Is Will right? Did Jesus rise from the dead? Is the other lawyer right? He is a, a, certainly not a Christian. So we'll take a look, a close look, a wonderful look at the resurrection. Ooh, that was a burp. At the resurrection file by Craig Parshall in just a little while. No more verbs. Signing out. <laughs>